And next, I'd like to introduce to you David Mor Morimoto, who's a uh, biologist at Lesley University. And I had the pleasure, along with a dozen other or so people, yesterday of uh, visiting the Alewife Reservation, which is a natural area which everybody can just walk over to from Alewife Station and see some remarkable things. So David. I'm here to answer the question, which came first, the walk or the talk? Because I was supposed to base my talk on the walk, but I used the walk as a way to practice my talk. It's funny how life reflects itself in that way. So I have 15 minutes, and we're running late to, uh, to sum up something that uh, uh, a three-and-a-half-hour walk, a three-hour walk, to talk about something that's going to take decades to accomplish. Um, I can't see. Yeah, that, that's it. And so I entitled this, I actually, like Nathan, came up with a phrase <laughs> or a term. Came up with a phrase or a term, I call it indigenous urban ecological knowledge. You might think it's a kind of crazy term, but you know, the etymology of the word indigenous means springing from place. And when you think, it actually has two things come to mind. For me, it's like, we lost indigenous knowledge when we wiped out the native people. Who's the invasive species here? And we have to reclaim that because that's really, natural history is the oldest continuous human activity, bar none. And the other thing is urban areas are actually centers of innovation and, create, and, and creativity and tremendous human biodiversity. And so they kind of speak to the importance of biodiversity in creating emergent understanding and emergent structures, et cetera. And our emergent understanding actually is telling us now that we actually need this nature to survive at the very same time that most of us live in places where there's not much of it. So I, I call that indigenous urban ecological knowledge, knowledge that we have to grasp. And it's, it's not just farming carbon out there. It's remembering that we're made of carbon and that we have to cultivate our own inner carbon, carbon as well. So. I call it the Great Carbon Disconnect. This is the uh, Boston Basin ecoregion. It's a map created by the Massachusetts Biomap Project. So it divides the state up into several different ecological regions. Ecology is very tough because boundaries are nebulous in some ways. I mean, we're all on one planet, so that's an easy boundary right there. Uh, but it's harder when you get to ecoregions. But this is the Boston Basin ecoregion. You can see developed land is 79%. And this is an old map. So by virtue of the fact that we've taken most of the uh, the natural environment out, with what we call the natural environment, out of the landscape uh, in the region, uh, we have much less contact with it, and we're all wearing clothes and buying things and eating things that aren't actually from or connected to the place. And we drive around in public transportation, motorized vehicles, going past things faster than we have for the bulk of our history on this planet, so we're missing things. It's obvious that we're actually disconnected. I mean, the loss of family farms has shown that, the loss of indigenous people before that. And, you know, how many people know what a, a blue-gray gnat catcher is or, a, you know, or the creatures are in their own backyard? Uh, so there's a really, this is a real critical thing. It's part of that whole urban metabolism thing. Not only are we constipated, uh, but Cambridge had a splenectomy, and we're really high on the autism, collective autism dis disorder spectrum in terms of being separated from the society of our kin. And so it's really clear here that, uh, and this is the watershed scale, I mean, just the word biodiversity technically is, occurs at multiple levels. It's another nebulous term because it's individual diversity, genetic diversity. Individuals interact in populations which interact in ecological communities uh, across ecological landscapes. And each one of those things is an ecosystem uh, and within a watershed which actually has a relatively well-defined geographical boundary. But it's clear that in this highly developed watershed that we've really disconnected. 80% of the people in this country live in cities, over half, as we just heard, live in uh, cities uh, across the world. And so the urban areas are the areas that are making decisions about things, but we're yet at the same time we're disconnected from the nature that uh, it's an obvious problem. <clears throat> it, actually, it's, it really, it's one of those things like Richard Louv's book on the, uh, the, the uh, nature deficit disorder. It, it was like a, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? It's kind of a clear answer. 
And so if you're going to farm carbon in, a, in an urban area where space is at a premium, uh, you want to look to areas where so-called ecosystem services or the benefits to humans from ecosystems uh, are most needed. And this is just a map of flooding in Cambridge, 6.2 square miles of, unpa of pa pretty much paved surface. Um, and so you can see uh, the alewife region up in the northwestern part of Cambridge is uh, a critical area. In fact, the Boston-based water study showed, uh, in addition, I think, to that Commonwealth Canal that Nathan showed, there's a, a proposal for an elevated commercial, a berm, to put the commercial enterprises up on in the alewife region because of expectations of flooding in the long term. But it makes sense to build a, a carbon forest or something like that, a carbon storage system in this area. And you can see where we walked yesterday, this is a topographic map. Uh, do I have a pointer? Yes. Is this a pointer? Two? Yeah. This is the, Ale the little pond, the, Ale the little river, and Alewife Reservation. I'll show you in the next slide here. Uh, Alewife Reservation is just this little linear 115-acre or so patch of habitat, uh, the, the little pond here, the little river, a, a bunch of little streams coming into it, um, and what was the civil maple forest over here. And so this is where there's a really good place to have a walk about carbon farming because this is a really it's sort of an enigmatic place. You know, here's Cambridge, Massachusetts. You hear about it every day in the world news. That there's something brilliant going on in Cambridge all the time, and there are th many brilliant things. I mean, we had an, uh, oops. We unpaved the parking lot and put up paradise in the Alewife Reservation right here. I mean, that's an amazing thing. You don't really get to see that very often in an urban area. And, we, and not only that, we managed the landscape. I mean, you can see that this is a heavily flooded area. This is a parking lot before, you know, it was flooded. And I uh, actually don't have the slide that was taken yesterday, but let me back up here. It's, oh, sorry. So you can see. Uh, it's a really interesting design here. And then actually the next, the next manipulation was this, the construction of the Cambridge stormwater wetlands. Stormwater runoff is the worst urban problem there is, most critical pro urban problem, I mean, in terms of short-term <coughs> short damage and impact. And so Cambridge is constructed. You should really go out there and see it. It's a whole board boardwalk system, the uh, constructed wetland, really uh, using an ecological knowledge, planting native plants at different places along the shoreline based on water level, trying to really restore the landscape. And this is, this is sort of like the spleen of the urban organism. Uh, the spleen, you know, it can live without a spleen, but the spleen is a, is, is a reservoir for blood, so it's actually really vital for, you know, if you have flood control, for example. So, so what we've done is created these basins that store the water and planted them with native plants to try to recreate this hydrological system, and it's, at the same time, it's storing carbon, obviously. And this is a, the other contrast. Recently, there's been, despite a decade-long battle led by the Friends of Alewife Reservation and, and, form, and citizens groups in Belmont, because uh, it's mostly in Belmont, the Silver Maple Forest, or the Bel Belmont Uplands Forest, has now been destroyed. I went in there with my students as it was being cut down, pretty much. We measured silver maples that were 80 centimeters in diameter, but they had four or five of those trunks in one tree. And, and giant poplars. I mean, there was a lot of carbon there. And I don't have the photo yet, but yesterday they were there with bulldozers, and you can see a big pile of sand. So, so much for the mycorrhizal fungi, and the entire system is gone. And, and when you look at the actual map, you can see that the silver maple forest was a crit. I mean, Alewife Reservation is a linear feature. And so, it doesn't have much edge habitat. It has a lot of different microhabitats. It has aspen trees and really pretty mature sumac stands and grasslands and, and wetlands. And so it's a rich, richly biodiverse. It's located on, on a fly, flyway for bird migration. Uh, but the silver maple forest, uh, because of development for uh, housing. And, and we fought, but despite, and this is, uh, and I think that despite the amazing work of Friends of Alewife Reservation and other groups, they had non denominational ecumenical services, they had art-based fundraisers, they had music-based fundraisers, they had all kinds of testimonials and forums that we hosted at Leslie. We testified before the Belmont Selectmen, before the Cambridge Selectmen, uh, Cambridge City Council, uh, uh, you name it. And uh, we ha I had a student arrested and a faculty member of mine arrested for civil disobedience. But I think the reason it didn't get done, just maybe, 
the developer was one reason he's not from this place and isn't connected to this place, but not enough people went in that place. Basically, that's it. We were so disconnected from nature that despite 10 years of trying to do this, still not enough people actually stepped foot in there and stepped heart in there. And so here's a map that uh, Friends of Real Life put, Reservation puts together about all the biodiversity. I mean, I've seen in the, in the silver maple forest, there are giant puffball mushrooms, gray fox, red fox, coyote, white-tailed deer, beaver, uh, northern river otter, fisher, um, muskrat, raccoon, skunk, uh, great horned owl, great blue heron, black crowned night herons, lots of migratory birds, and I saw snakes and birds leaving the forest, deer tracks jumping over the barriers when the forest was being, it was really, it's hard for me to go back there. And so it was really difficult. Yesterday, that's where we ended the walk uh, at that Belmont Uplands. And, uh, and again, the, the reason that I think we failed is a lot of political reasons, but I mean, the people that we were uh, appealing to who had the power over the developer um, said they agreed with us, but was still somehow tied by the hands of the system or not enough will of the people was uh, was represented, but I think it was really because we didn't integrate ourselves into the landscape enough. And I think that's really what my talk is all about is, I mean, we can talk all about biodiversity. I mean, a recent study in science shows that uh, biodiversity is the one critical thing that actually contributes to ecosystem stability. So obviously we want that if we want to farm carbon for the long term. Uh, but really, I, I'm thinking that we really have to culti cultivate the carbon as in ourselves. We are carbon-based organisms. I mean, I, our melanocytes were stimulated by our closest star yesterday. <laughs> Some of the carbon dioxide that was emitted because of oxidative metabolism of the carbon-based food that we ate actually was farmed by the plants at Alewife yesterday. And we actually consumed the oxygen to help us fuel that oxidative metabolism. It's really a beautiful thing. Not only that, but our feet felt the soft earth and our eyes hurt, saw the birds and we smelled the smells. And I can't tell you how much, I mean, I can tell you actually, this is a picture of the forest before and I only have five minutes to tell you, but you know, the, the perspective of, of our relationship to nature has changed, not, not I mean, these are different views of human rela relationships to nature over the years that have predominated. Not one of them has really supplanted the other, but the recent one is about so socio-ecological systems. They're, they're, in, they're uh, ineluctably connected, or uh, you just they're part of one system. Resilience, adaptability, people and nature. So it's really an enlightened perspective, but you can't do it unless you actually uh, walk the walk. <laughs> A recent study of using a normalized difference vegetation index around Massachusetts elementary schools found that elementary schools surrounded by, not directly by, but in, the, in their local region, the densest vegetation actually had the highest MCAS scores. And it was a really tight correlation. That's just one of many studies on the psychosocial benefits. I mean, Your Brain on Nature is one good book. Uh, Last Child in the Woods is a classic one by Richard Louvre talking about uh, nature deficit disorder. Shinrin Yoku is a huge movement in Japan that's showing that blood flow actually moves away from your prefrontal cortex, giving you cognitive load relief, uh, co cognitive relief when you're in natural settings, and it's shunted to your emotional senses, your brain. And, and so we think that our hunter-gatherer ancestors are much more empathic with the prey and much more in touch with the local environment because of that. So, but it does give cognitive relief. It lowers systolic blood pressure. It actually increases immune function. Even in in vitro studies, natural killer cells will increase due to the exposure to chemicals emitted by the trees. And so, it, I mean, there's remarkable research out there that immersion in nature is what makes us normal. So we, I, my main point is that, that we need, this is my student, Gina Giuliano, getting arrested in front of the Silver Maple Forest. And so uh, basically indigenous urban ecological knowledge uh, tells us a lot of things, but it basically tells us that nature makes us normal in addition to providing uh, all of these so-called services and benefits and farming carbon. But the carbon is in us too, remember that. We're not actually separable from it. We are, as Adam said at the beginning, that we're part of one system, it's our heritage. And like the alewife, which has to overcome all the obstacles of human uh, 
human manipulation of the landscape to, to try to complete their age-old migrations up those streams. And doing it right now, believe it or not, Little Pond area is a coastal zone area, but it's no longer really influenced by, by, the, by the sea because of all the dams and things. But the alewives still try to make it because it's there. It's who they are. And so I think who we are, we have to overcome the barriers that we put up in urban areas and regain our natural history roots to become the normal humans that we are. If we really want to farm carbon for the long term, we have to realize that we're actually on the farm too, and it's an inward and an outward journey. Thank you.